we talked about biblical manhood and now biblical womanhood. Let's pause and say a word of prayer and then dive into this. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray now for you to continue giving our, our minds and hearts strength to endure sound doctrine and also to consider things that may push on our hearts in challenging ways. Grant us the help of your Spirit and your wisdom for tricky things. Um, may our hearts see a clarity that can help us live for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As with um, manhood, I have tried to summarize this in a series of brief sentences, so go ahead and look through those with me now. A God-honoring woman humbly watches for every opportunity to nurture life and develop God-honoring beauty. She would joyfully embrace a role as a wife or mother if God wills. She works together as a helper with men to fulfill God's purposes, submitting within appropriate relationships. And then the last two sentences are just the mirror image of the last two sentences for men committed to sexual activity only according to God's design within a marriage covenant with one man and thoughtful about culturally appropriate expressions of womanhood. So let's start at the beginning. A God-honoring woman humbly watches for every opportunity to nurture life. So as I use the word responsibility as a way to sum up the heart of manhood, I'm using the phrase nurturing life as a way to try to sum up if we had to put it just down to extremely short, a way to summarize the heart of womanhood. Genesis 1, verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so as we said earlier, God created humans so that they can only reproduce together as male and female. And the woman's role in that is especially profound because while a man is required for conception, after that point, the growth and development of that new human life until birth comes entirely from the mother. To be a woman is to be the kind of human being who has the capacity to have another human life develop from and within your own body. It is an astonishing miracle. Genesis 3, verse 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And so it's not a surprise that in the Bible, women's greatest joys and heartaches are tied to their children or inability to have children or the choices made by their children. Genesis 3, verse 16, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing in pain, you shall bring forth children. Sin would make childbearing and motherhood more difficult, but it could not remove their central significance. Now, we know that it is not God's will for every woman to bear her own children, but I don't see how we can define biblical womanhood without referring to nurturing life. As one author put it, Women are trained early through their bodies to be aware of the needs of the people around them and to learn what it is to nurture others. They have the courage and deep impulse to give life to others at all costs. And so, nurturing life can happen in many ways besides bearing one's own children. Nurturing can happen in many other relationships, Nurturing can happen in jobs and with animals and in gardens and so forth, as well as in the church. The most important kinds of nurture, ultimately, are spiritual kinds of nurture. So remember what was said about singleness in the previous message and the importance of the family of God as being even more important than our earthly families and the importance of spiritual parenting. One little moment that I love in the New Testament, Romans 16, verse 13, Paul sends greetings to Rufus and his mom. And then he says, she has been a mother to me as well. That's such a brilliant little example of a nurturing mindset that is not just about one's own, the children one bears, but an all of life, 
Paul was not the apostle she nurtured, though he was not her own child. Another interesting little moment in Scripture is Exodus chapter 1, when several different women in Exodus chapter 1, the Hebrew midwives whose names are given, Shifra and Pua, as well as Moses' sister and the daughter of Pharaoh, all these women nurture life in a way that saves the nation of Israel, even though it's not their children. When Titus 2 calls older women to teach younger women, that is a call to nurture spiritual life in them. So whether or not a woman bears her own children, all Christian women can, should, nurture life. Now, our sentence goes on to say, a God-honoring woman humbly watches for every opportunity to nurture life and develop God-honoring beauty. We know that women have a significant advantage as compared to men when it comes to being beautiful. And the Bible also indicates that women have an inclination to adorn themselves and the world around them. I don't think Eve's beauty is directly referred to here in early Genesis, and yet when God brought her to Adam, Genesis 2, verse 22, he responded by bursting into a poem or a song. He was one excited guy. And so the next verses, Genesis 2, 24 and 25, tell us that a man's inclination will be to leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Why? Partly because God made her beautiful. And as the Bible goes on, it is clear that women have this inclination to adorn themselves and to adorn the world around them. Now, someone will say, but... I'm a woman, and I'm not very good at making things beautiful. I'm good at getting my hands dirty, and I don't know how to match colors and do fancy hairdos, so am I less of a woman? No, not at all, for several reasons. First of all, I'd point out that the things you do that get your hands dirty may well be things that are nurturing life or beautifying the world. Maybe you love farming or animals or gardening or pottery or home improvement. All those things require some strength in your muscles and some dirt under your nails, and yet they're nurturing and they're beautifying. But even more importantly, the main point that the Bible makes about a woman's beauty is that it is the beauty of a woman's good works and her heart. It's fascinating that, okay, so earlier I referred to 1 Timothy 2, 8, which, which points us in this direction of, of, of men's strength and then their struggle with, with uh, aggression and anger and so forth. First, the next verses, 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, instruct women to pursue not so much external beauty, but the beauty of good works. It's like this, this, this parallel there. First Peter chapter 3, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. The beauty of a woman's heart with a special emphasis on the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is not referring to a woman's volume, but to a heart that can rest because it's full of trust in God. So women tend to be more beautiful than men, and they tend to want to beautify themselves and the world around them more than men, and this is a very good aspect of God's creation. And so a godly woman looks for opportunities to develop beauty. Yet it does not mean that all women will be interior decorators because the beauty that truly matters is the beauty of a woman's Christ-like heart. Now, as a woman seeks beauty in these ways, the Bible emphasizes that she must do this with modesty. Along with beauty comes power. And just as we learn that men can misuse their strength, so women can misuse their beauty, which is why the Bible calls for modesty. Modesty simply means that a woman should not use her beauty for selfish gain or sensual gain. She should not use her beauty in arrogance to make herself the center of everyone's attention, nor should she use her beauty in sensuality to seduce others for her sexual pleasure. And again, it's fascinating because of the parallel to men. A man shouldn't use his strength to attract everyone's attention to himself, and a man shouldn't use his strength to get sexual pleasure by force. And so in a similar way, a woman shouldn't use her beauty to attract everyone's attention to herself, and a woman shouldn't use her beauty to seduce men to get the sexual pleasure she wants. 
Rather, she uses her beauty for God-honoring purposes and seeks to beautify the world around her. And then, finally, the most important thing we can say about beauty is that it is not only ultimately a matter of the heart, which is wonderful news because every woman will age and die. It's not only a matter of the heart, but beauty is also a gracious gift of God's love who makes a woman beautiful forever. Rachel Aldizer wrote it like this, a woman is beautiful to God because He loves her. Love turns us beautiful. We are beautiful because the beautiful one laid down His very life for us and made us His bride. We are lovely in His sight because we are loved. So whether you are the kind of woman who might win a beauty pageant or the kind of woman who grimaces at the very mention of that, God loves His daughters and makes them beautiful through Christ. So what we've seen so far is that a God-honoring woman humbly watches for every opportunity to nurture life and develop God-honoring beauty. And this nurturing and beautifying is not dependent upon a woman marrying or having her own children. It is a God-given inclination that can make a God-honoring impact in every part of life and in all different sorts of relationships. However, a godly woman will joyfully embrace a role as a wife or mother if that would be what God wills for her. And I won't repeat here the things that we said in the previous marriage uh, message about the, 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 the tremendous importance of marriage as designed by God. We talked about that before. Here in Genesis chapter 2, we read, verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And verse 22, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man, brought her to her husband. And so marriage is something that women can rightfully desire. Marriage to a godly man who understands biblical manhood and biblical marriage. A man who can lead a marriage with a mission and purpose and be a dad who leads a family with a mission and purpose. That kind of marriage is something that a Christian woman can rightfully long for because it's a setting in which her God-given strength as a woman can flourish. And then a godly woman is also eager to embrace a role as mother if God wills. Now, we've already talked about nurturing life, but you know that our, our society exalts every possible career for a woman except motherhood. Being an astronaut is awesome. Being a corporate CEO is awesome. Being a UFC fighter is awesome. But being a mom, dumb, boring, and even oppressive. Society also communicates to women that their body's capacity to bear children is a burden to be avoided, even hormonically and surgically ended. That is tragic. Generally speaking, it is a good thing for women to have equal opportunities in education in the workplace. It is a terrible thing for motherhood to be degraded and despised. That is a work of Satan. God created a world where life would be abundant. Here in Genesis 2, 28, we see that he created, I mean Genesis 1, 28, that he created male and female to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Over in, again, in Genesis 3, 16, we've already read it, but we see that the consequences of sin upon the woman would impact this central part of her life related to to marriage and childbearing. The psalmist calls children a heritage from the Lord. Again, we are not saying that a woman can only honor God if she bears her own children. We already define nurturing life as something that goes beyond just physical motherhood. Biological motherhood is not God's will for every woman, and sometimes circumstances, including sickness and other types of suffering and the consequences of sin in some situations even make that impossible. What we're saying is that a godly woman understands the importance of marriage and family, and so she would embrace those roles if God would allow that. And if God allows that, she will wholeheartedly sacrifice and pour out her life to serve her husband and children just as a man is called to pour out his life in self-sacrificing love for that household. The world despises that idea because the world is deceived and they have completely lost track of what it means to be human and what it means to be a woman. So we've seen that a God-honoring woman humbly watches for every opportunity to nurture life and develop God-honoring beauty 
and she would joyfully embrace a role as wife or mother if God wills. All right, that's all the easy part. Now, we continue with a description that is very countercultural and yet very biblical. She works together as a helper with men to fulfill God's purposes, submitting within appropriate relationships. As we said earlier, the one human distinction that is emphasized in Genesis 1 is male and female. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And then in the next verse, Genesis 1, 28, God gave to them that creation mandate, calling humanity to fill and rule the world on his behalf, and neither male nor female could carry out that purpose on their own. And so we come again to chapter 2, verse 18. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, we most often think of that in terms of marriage. and This would be a marriage between Adam and Eve. But there is a broader principle that neither men nor women can fully carry out the creation mandate on our own, that we are teammates, not just in marriage, but actually in all of life. And the woman is called helper. It's rightfully pointed out often that the word helper is most often used in the Old Testament for God who helps his people. And so there is nothing undignified about helping because it's a characteristic of God himself. God gave to the man the responsibility to carry out God's purposes on earth, and then he created an essential helper in the woman. She was very much like him, as we said at the beginning of the last message, and yet she had her own strengths and distinctions that man desperately needed. So, in all of life, we can expect men and women to team together for human flourishing, complementing one another. We see that in everything from the patriarchs of Israel to the good kings of Israel to the disciples of Jesus to the teammates of the the apostles, men and women working together in all of those different situations. So, a godly woman works together as a helper with men to fulfill God's purposes, submitting within appropriate relationships. What word is more hated by our culture than the word submission? Now, first of all, understand that the Bible never teaches that women in general submit to men in general. It never teaches that. It teaches that men have a first responsibility to carry out God's purposes and that women are designed as essential helpers. But submission only happens within appropriate relationships, which primarily refers to a wife submitting to her husband in marriage. Now, there are other relationships where both men and women submit to authority. Citizens submit to government. Children submit to parents. Church families submit to pastors. We'll say more about those things in just a minute. So women submit in those areas too, but it's not because they're women. It's because they're citizens or daughters or church members. The one area in which the Bible clearly says that a woman must submit to a man is in marriage. 1 Peter 3, verse 5, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Ephesians 5, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. 1 Corinthians 11.3, the head of a wife is her husband. That same verse also says that the head of Christ is God. The Son of God came as Messiah, operating under the authority of God the Father, and so clearly being under a head is not demeaning, because it is true of Jesus himself. Now, I'm not trying to teach a lesson about marriage, so I don't want to spend too much time going down this route, but because marital submission is something unique to womanhood, I do want to comment on it briefly. What is submission in marriage? The best way to understand it is, first of all, to think back to the message on biblical manhood. God holds the man responsible. In Genesis 1 and 2, the man is the one who first began to carry out the creation mandate, and the command to not eat of the tree of the garden was specifically given to him In Genesis 3, the woman was deceived and sinned first, yet Adam was held responsible first. Now, look, women are always responsible for their own sin. And a woman's sin can ruin a marriage. 
I'm not saying that a man is responsible for a woman's sin or for a marriage that falls apart because of a woman's sin. But God does hold a man responsible for the direction and purpose of the marriage, the Christ-centeredness of a marriage, the leadership of a marriage. God says that the husband is the head. Okay, so the first step to understanding submission is to remember that God is holding the man responsible as the head of that household for that marriage. Then, remember that the woman is created by God to be the helper. Adam was the one ultimately responsible for the household. Eve was the essential helper. They were a team to carry out the creation mandate and also to carry out the new creation mandate in the Great Commission. The one responsible to God for the team is the husband. The woman is the helper. That's the context in which we can properly understand submission. From that, we can see that submission does not mean that a husband gets to be the boss and do whatever he wants. Remember, a husband's role is to lay down his life in self-sacrifice for his wife. So submission definitely does not mean that a wife exists to do whatever her husband wants her to do. Submission does not mean that a husband is smarter than his wife or wiser than his wife. Submission does not mean that a husband is always right. And submission does not mean that a husband makes all the decisions. Submission does not mean that a wife never provides any leadership in the home. As a matter of fact, there may be many aspects of home life in which her leadership is essential. See Proverbs 31. Submission is also freely given, not forced. The Bible never tells husbands to submit their wives to themselves. And submission is also not absolute. Christ is the only absolute authority over every person. So then what is submission? I think Kevin DeYoung, and by the way, I I, I definitely recommend to you his book, Men and Women in the Church. Um, I may not agree with every part of it, but I don't agree with every part of any book on this. (laughs) Nobody does. This This is hard stuff. But I think he captures it well with three words. Support, respect, and follow. Knowing that God holds her husband responsible for this household, a godly wife will seek to support him as his essential helper, respect him as the God-given head, and follow his leadership as best as she can. Now, there's so much more we could get into there. Entire book's written about it, but hopefully that gives us just a little glimpse into what submission is and isn't. Now, I also need to comment briefly on men and women in the church because this is another area in which the instructions to women are not identical to the instructions to men. This is an area of intense controversy among Christians today. Um, We could be here all day. There was recently a 10-hour video series released on YouTube about just one passage about men and women in the church. Ten hours on one passage. And we're going to try to cover it in five minutes. So, let's talk briefly about leading and then teaching in the church, understanding that this is an area in which Christians come to a a wide variety of different uh, conscience positions and church positions. First of all, 1 Timothy 2 and 3 make it clear that pastors are males. Just as God holds Husbands are responsible as the head in an earthly marriage household. So God holds male pastors responsible to oversee the household of God in the local church. Both men and women are called to submit to the godly, biblically faithful leadership of those pastors. However, under the umbrella of pastoral oversight, many people who aren't pastors provide leadership in many ways. In church. Remember, that's what we're talking about right now, the local church. They might, they might have official leadership like a lead greeter or a nursery director or the person who's in charge of planning a church event. Or it might be unofficial leadership like a brother or sister who just gr- gathers together a group of people after church to pray. Leadership is responsibility and influence, and many people in a church family have responsibility and influence. Under the overarching leadership of the pastors, you have both men and women with responsibility and influence. It's new creation teamwork, just as we saw from the original creation in Genesis. Women are individually gifted for ministry, just as men are. 
Women are essential parts of the church body, just as men are. We work together as brothers and sisters in the church under the oversight of the pastors. Now, in those scenarios that I'm describing, there is an additional question that is one of the most controversial questions, and this is about whether it's right in the church for women to have direct authority over a man. For example, is it right for a woman to be a children's ministry director if she has male teachers under her leadership? The reason why it's a question is because 1 Timothy 2.12, when talking about the local church, says, I do not permit a woman to exercise authority over a man. Now again, he is not talking about all of life. He's talking about life in the church. And the key question is whether what he says there for, is just forbidding women from being pastors, since just a couple verses later he begins describing the qualification of pastors, 1 Timothy 3, or is he saying something more broadly to forbid women from having direct authority over a man in any area of church life? That's the tricky question. It is not entirely clear. And so churches have different policies about that, and, and Christians have different conscience positions, individual conscience positions um, about that. But and, and my purpose this morning is not to define GBC's exact position on every one of these details. This is too brief for me to do that. But here's what I, I know. First of all, we need women exercising their gifts, including gifts of leadership and administration in various areas of church life. We have to have that. And as pastors, we really work hard to try to help women utilize their gifts and flourish in ministry. And we also try very hard to listen to the women in the church and understand their perspectives and their wisdom and their insight. We need that. And I know that that can be healthy and can work well. And then I also know that if men and women have the right attitude, if we are committed to the Christ-like manhood and womanhood that we've been describing today, then it works out. <laughs> and that might sound like a cop-out, but I don't think that's a cop-out because each situation is unique. Each church is different. Each situation, each leadership situation is different. We are brothers and sisters who are also teammates. And in so each of those specific situations, we figure it out together as we walk with the Lord, think biblically, apply Bible principles, and live in Christ-like ways. It does not have to be something divisive or damaging or harmful in the church. Pastors are the God-given leaders with the responsibility for the whole church, and that is a role that, is, that God has given to godly, qualified men. Under that overarching leadership, men and women are teammates together in all of church life, maximizing their gifts for the glory of God. Now, <clears throat> we're still not done <laughs> with the hard stuff, because the other aspect of church life in which there are specific instructions for women is the area of teaching. There are two passages 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14, which call for women to learn quietly and to not teach men. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 14 seems to be talking specifically about evaluating prophecies when the church is gathered and saying that women shouldn't do that. There's disagreement about that, but some very, very good conservative Bible scholars um, are convinced that's what 1 Corinthians 14 is, is talking about, weighing whether a prophecy is biblical or not. 1 Timothy 2 seems to be saying that the overall teaching responsibility for the church is given by God to the men, especially to the pastors, and that it's not appropriate for women to authoritatively instruct the church men. At the same time, 1 Corinthians 11 indicates that women could be appropriately involved in verbal ministry in the church gatherings, including praying and prophesying. So we know that those other passages are not saying women literally must not be heard in church or in church services. So again, I, I'm not trying to define exactly what GBC's positions are on all these things, but you can observe that here at GBC, there are aspects of public teaching and public worship leading that we limit to men. And most of the time, it's pastors that do those in the church-wide gathering. Because the way we carry out that main 930 service is very pastoral. 
in really almost all of the pieces of what we do in that service. I'm not saying that, the, that there could not be a time when we incorporate women in something like scripture reading in that service. I do believe we could appropriately do that. But many aspects of the way we conduct our worship services, it's our pastors and past, direct pastoral oversight that is leading those things. And so we have men do that, trying to be faithful to 1 Timothy chapter 2. But then there are many other aspects of church life in which both men and women are present. And sorry, I skipped a sentence. There are other official church situations in which we are authoritatively teaching the Bible to both men and women. And once again, we have men do that. But then there are many other aspects of church life in which both men and women are present and women are welcome to be actively and verbally involved. That doesn't mean they always are. For some women, there's a conscience position there that leads them to stay quiet or a personality thing that leads them to stay quiet. But there are many situations in which women are welcome to be actively and verbally involved. That includes prayer meetings, testimony services, special services like Christmas Eve, training events, small group studies, discipleship connects. Do you, do you notice that in none of those settings do you ever hear us saying, all right, men only with men, women only with women. Men on this side of the room, women on this side of the room. We're not doing that because we see in Scripture that men and women can speak to one another in the Lord, learn from one another in the Lord, and build up the church together while honoring what the Bible says about the authoritative teaching of the church. So the questions about women's leadership in the church or women's teaching in the church are not simple. But again, I'll say that if we honor what Scripture clearly says, and then if we demonstrate the Christ-like heart of manhood and womanhood that we've been describing today, then we can figure it out together, led by the Lord, one situation at a time, about what would be the best exact application in this exact aspect of, of our local church's life. Okay, all of that comes under the heading that reads, she works together as a helper with men to fulfill God's purposes, submitting within appropriate relationships. Next, she is committed to sexual activity only according to God's design within a marriage covenant with one man. So this is the mirror of what we said to the men. A godly woman, because of God's calling on her life, demonstrated in the body that God has given to her, she will reject any kind of homosexual lifestyle. She'll also reject any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage, including casual sex and pornography. Birth control and abortion have made it possible for our society to glorify the freedom of women to have sex whenever they want. But sexual freedom is sin against God. It is not actually freedom, even if birth control or abortion allow you to get away with it. Finally, a godly woman is thoughtful about culturally appropriate expressions of womanhood and does not seek to present herself as a man. <clears throat> Same explanation from the end of the sermon on biblical manhood. Basically, the Bible tells us that while culture doesn't define biblical manhood and womanhood, Christians thoughtfully consider the culturally appropriate expressions of those things because a woman is proud to be a woman. That's what God created her to be. And so she wants to be seen and known as a woman, not as a man. And again, that doesn't mean we have to fit into every stereotype, but that a godly woman will be thoughtful about culturally appropriate expressions of, of womanhood. All right. I'm trying to breathe. <laughs> With both of these messages today, a factor that has weighed very heavily on my, my mind and heart has been those people who might listen to what I'm saying and feel like, Pastor Tim, I just don't fit with what you're saying very well. I can see how a man could say that about some of the things I said about manhood this morning, and hopefully I clarified that as I went along. It might even be more likely for a woman to say that about biblical womanhood. I don't fit this very well. A woman might say, I'm just not a very girly girl. <laughs> or, I'm not married. Or, 
I'm divorced, or I'm a single parent, or marriage was a terrible experience for me, or I want children, but I can't have them, or I've never really wanted children. I didn't grow up dreaming about being a mom, or I've been through some tough things and I have a really hard time with men. You're telling us to be teammates, but I'm not so sure about that. Or I'm just not a homebody. Or I'm not the helper type. I'm kind of wired to be a leader. Or I've got a loud voice. I grew up in a home with a mom with a big booming voice. Or my body's built kind of tough. And I kind of thrive on things like the gym and strength training and sports. Or I've got an intense or aggressive personality. Or I really love teaching the Bible and learning theology. And I'd love to be able to do something like go to seminary and really dig into the Bible. Or I work outside the home right now and I really like my job. Or my hobbies tend to be things that guys usually like to do. And so I can see how many of those things might make a woman wonder if she really fits, if she can really be a biblical woman. And so I want to tell you something that encouraged me, and this is what I'm going to close with this morning, and I think it has general application for all of us, even though I'm talking specifically to, to women who might say they just don't fit in. As I prepared for these messages, one of the books that I read um, included an overview of many of the men and women in the Bible, many of the key men and almost every woman in the Bible they, they talked about, not all the ones, in, you know, genealogies or whatever, but if there's any information about them. That was really fascinating. And one of the things that jumped out to me from that was that when you look at the women in the New Testament, you have example after example after example of women whose situations were really unique. And I am sure that God guided the Scriptures to include all of those unique examples for the encouragement of women who say, I'm just not sure I fit. For example, there are women who were the first witnesses of the resurrection and the first witnesses to the disciples. There are a number of women in the New Testament, Christian women, who probably had substantial amounts of money and were major influential donors in their churches, patrons they're called, and also supporting missionaries. There are a number of women who hosted churches in their homes, which by itself is a kind of leadership <laughs> for that church that's meeting there. There's Phoebe, who is called a servant of the church, possibly a deaconess. There were women like Priscilla and Junia who seemed to travel together with their husbands as traveling missionaries or church planters rather than being rooted in one location with a consistent home. And it's also likely that those women did not have children. Priscilla is also fascinating because she worked together with her husband to recognize the weaknesses of Apollos' understanding of the Scriptures and then to instruct him more accurately in the Gospel. There were women who anointed Jesus' feet. There were a number of women who probably had unsaved, women, uh, unsaved, women, unsaved husbands who didn't come to church with them. There were women who prophesied. There were all sorts of women with broken family situations, including many women who were unmarried, widowed, or in some other way not in a typical marriage situation. There were the women who left their homes to travel along with Jesus and were vital parts of the consistent group of traveling disciples. There's Timothy's mother and grandmother who trained their son in the Scriptures even though dad wasn't there, apparently, to, to take that responsibility. There were women who were called fellow workers with the Apostle Paul, and he says, they labored side by side with me. That's an apostle talking. And so what I love is that none of that contradicts what the Bible says about biblical manhood or womanhood. And none of that invalidates the tremendous significance of marriage and motherhood in a godly household. 
And yet all of that provides rich encouragement for any woman who says, do I count? Can I still be a God-honoring woman even, I ha- even, even though I have this unique situation? Even though I have this hard situation? Yes, you can. God uses all of the variety, all of the uniqueness among us. And God redeems and uses our broken and hard situations. That is such a marvelous truth in all that we've talked about this morning. That God redeems and uses our broken and hard situations. So do not fear that you might be too far outside of the ideal picture of biblical womanhood. If you're committed to Christ, if you're growing to be like Christ, if you want to honor these principles that we've talked about this morning from God's Word, then He's going to use you uniquely, richly, in ways that will matter forever. I hope that is encouraging for you. It was encouraging for me. All right. I'm going to close uh, this with a, and I am closing both the manhood and womanhood messages with a charge and a benediction. The charge is Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And so it comes right there in, in the context of teaching for men and women and husbands and wives. And then the benediction is from Ephesians 6, verse 23. So first of all, Ephesians 5, 1. What a fantastic phrase for men and women. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And then Ephesians 6, verse 23. Peace be to you as brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope the Lord will encourage you with all those truths.